Welcome to Szechuan Palace, or Hunan Taste, or Golden Dragon, or Jade King. Whatever the name, it's a taste of the Far East in your hometown. And as you're drawn in closer, seduced by exotic aromas, you slide into your booth and behold, sweet and sour pork, fried rice, and for that authentic finish, a fortune cookie. Enjoy. But don't think you've just consumed a Chinese meal. The foods you just feasted on are as American as the hot dog. In fact, a whole lot of Chinese food, our favorite ethnic food, is just that, ours. It's American. The first large group of Chinese immigrants was lured to America in the 1850s by stories of the Golden Mountains of California. It was gold rush fever. And thousands of Chinese, mostly from the southern Chinese city of Canton, answered the call. In San Francisco, where most of the immigrants landed, the Chinese clustered in one section of town soon known as Chinatown, an oasis of traditional Chinese culture swirling with the inescapable smells of traditional Chinese foods. Most of the Chinese immigrants to America were farmers and served the peasant food of Canton, a simple menu featuring stir-fried meals with rice, mild tea, and platefuls of dim sum, traditional finger food that included everything from shrimp dumplings to tripe to bird's feet. The first Chinese restaurant served these foods from home to Chinese customers who couldn't or didn't want to cook. This is a heavily male migration, and whenever you have a heavily male migration, you get a, um, a proliferation of restaurants to serve those men without women. You see the same case in the Greek and the Italian migrations that you see in the Chinese migration. Lots of restaurants. Chow chows, they were called, and they offered all you could eat for a buck to hungry Chinese laborers. But then something odd happened. Pretty soon, the non-Chinese were coming in, and the Chinese realized that this is a business. This is a business in itself. So before long, restaurants started popping up. Of course, the owners knew they'd have to westernize their food a bit to keep the non-Chinese coming. But the Chinese adapted. Which is not to say all was harmony. The Americans were often referred to as Lo Fan, or the barbarians. And what the barbarians wanted was chop suey. Chop suey has its roots in Canton, where the words sop suey mean miscellaneous scraps. And that just about sums it up. Chop suey is Chinese leftovers. Its exact origins are clouded in mystery. But it was created here in America. One story has to do with a Chinese cook faced with a bunch of hungry miners, again in the off hours when he doesn't have a whole lot left in the kitchen, but they're hungry, they've got money in their pockets. He chops up whatever he's got, puts it on a sauce, throws it on some rice, and hands it to them. And a very flexible idea at that. Chop suey was usually made from whatever vegetables Chinese cooks could get their hands on. Carrots, potatoes, and tomatoes were just as likely to turn up in chop suey as water chestnuts or Chinese cabbage. The meat could be whatever the customer wanted. The most essential ingredients were bean sprouts, soy sauce, and more soy sauce. If they were going to eat Chinese, Americans wanted as much of that Chinese flavor as they could get. As for Chinese food, the customers still came, even though there were rumors that all sorts of creatures were secretly being chopped into chop suey. Mice, rats, or your neighbor's missing pet. There's a lot of concern about how clean it is. Um, and there's, the, but there's also the sense you can safely eat in what is otherwise seen as a kind of a dangerous neighborhood. And it's kind of thrilling to go to Chinatown in the years around 1900 as a tourist. And guidebooks really sell it that way. And I mean, are Chinese restaurateurs going to turn down these, these, these paying customers? Of course they're not. America was feeling good by the end of the First World War. The war was won, and the stock market looked to climb forever. The exotic was what the country craved now. The new music was jazz, and the fashionable food was Chinese. 
In cities across the country, Chinatowns lit up with neon. Sleek Art Deco lunchrooms began offering dinner for one and dinner for two. For many, many years, that's all we saw because there, there was nothing else that was really known. The Chinese chef didn't speak English, the Caucasian customers did not speak Chinese, but they had a common ground, a dinner one for one, dinner for two. Pick one item from column A and one from column B, and the top sellers, egg rolls and wonton soup. And sweet and sour pork, another crude American revision of an old Cantonese recipe. And the meal was always finished off with a fortune cookie. It's only natural that the message in the cookie knows our future. This is from China with its 3,000 years of wisdom. Except that the cookie didn't originate in China. It's most likely from California. There was a tradition in China of hiding messages in cakes. It said that rebels in the 12th century got messages past the emperor's guards in what were called moon cakes. But the first of the sweet folded envelopes, the way we eat them now, are often credited to the owner of a Chinese eatery in L.A. The story goes he came up with the idea in 1916 as a way to amuse his customers awaiting their orders. They're entertaining. They contain an element of surprise, and the mixture of entertainment with food has been a very important theme in sort of the introduction of foreigners to American culinary life. We like entertainment along with our food. And I think the fortune cookie gives us entertainment along with something sweet. The combination of the flavors and the exotic found in Chinese restaurants proved irresistible. Oh, the real Chinese dishes are over here. Chinese food became an official American diversion. You know, there's there's no telling what we'll get, but I'm willing to take a chance if you are. Oh, that's the fun of it, Bob. Here, girls, here's the ways how to use the chopsticks. Eating with sticks, once sneered at as a sure sign of Chinese inferiority, was now the signature skill of the sophisticated diner. Nothing was more fun than going to a Chinese restaurant to share a table full of steaming platters. Chinese love to eat. We never ask you, how are you? We ask you, have you eaten? Sick me, uh. Have you eaten? Because we want to, the door to be open for us to feed you some more. Uh, food is a way of communicating love, friendship, and for the Chinese people, the only way to eat is to put all the food in the middle and share. In the 1950s, the boom in food for the road made no dent in the Chinese business. They'd been offering food to go for a hundred years. Chinese restaurateurs may even take the credit for inventing American takeout. 19th century waiters from Chinese eateries regularly took whole meals, complete with plates, bowls, and silverware, to private homes. When President Nixon opened relations with the People's Republic of China in 1972, interest in a wider range of Chinese foods rose sharply. The Cantonese grip on the American market came to an end. The craze for authentic Chinese food began to spread. Restaurants serving food from Hunan, Shanghai, or Nanking appeared next to the chop suey houses. Today, few people order chop suey. American eaters have forsaken the simple improvised meals that taught them to love Chinese food. But chop suey secured a permanent place for Chinese food in America's palate. In a land of immigrants, Chinese may be only one of many wildly different flavors, but as one of the first exotic ethnic foods, it won enough affection and acceptance that in the end, it is as American as apple pie. Especially when you remember that apple pie is imported too. We got that from England. And speaking of imports, when the fortune cookie finally crossed the Pacific and showed up on Asian restaurant tables in 1989, it was touted as the genuine American fortune cookie.